It's about time for us to begin this morning. Thank you all for being out. It's good to see everybody. We're glad that you are are with us. I think we have some uh, visitors with us today. We're thankful for your attendance. We'd love for you to fill out a visitor's card and uh, drop it in the collection plate as it goes around. Uh, we'd like to have a record of your attendance. We're thankful for everyone who is here today. A uh, couple of uh, sad announcements. Miss Helen Nipper's uh, funeral is today at the Pikeville Funeral Home. That'll be at 2 p.m. Uh, the ladies are fixing food for that family uh, here at here at the building. Also, the passing of Miss Sheila Rankin. She died uh, early yesterday morning. Her body is at Putnam Reed Funeral Home. They are visiting tomorrow, Monday, from 4 until 8. That funeral is Tuesday. They have changed that fun that time from from 1 p.m. to 12 noon. So keep that in mind. Sheila's funeral is at 12 noon there at the Putnam Reed uh, Funeral Home. Prayers for both of those families. Uh, Roy Pendergrass has a large mass on his lung. Uh, biopsy is the first step, and then I'm sure there will be a plan of attack. Uh, prayers for Roy and Carol and that family. Miss Inez Millwood is not doing well. Uh, prayers for her and for Richard and Tundalea as they look after her and try to take care of her. Uh, tonight, ladies' meeting and elders' deacons right after the evening service. The ladies' class is Tuesday night here at the building at 6 p.m. Friday is the Friday night singing. This Friday, Bethel hosting the Friday night singing at 7 p.m. Hope you'll be able to attend. The gift card for Jayla and Derek, they're getting married. Wednesday night is the last night if you'd like to contribute to that gift card. Wednesday night is the last night to do that. Lisa Harmon and Melissa Real are in charge of it. Two gospel meetings in our area, one at Sequatchie Valley with Steve Brown, the other at Dunlap with Ben Vick. They both go through Thursday night at 7 p.m., so keep those meetings in mind. Birthdays. Burl Johnson has a birthday today. Ferris Cartwright has a birthday tomorrow. Landry Measles' birthday is the 16th. And then on the 20th, Beth Long and Jared and Anderson have birthdays. We'll sing to them at the close of our service. This morning, Mark Cagle is, is leading us in our song service. Spencer Strickland is leading us in prayer. Presiding at the Lord's table is Jason Reel. Serving the audience, uh, Andrew and Isaac Deboard, Tim Peters, Brent Hurst, Sawyer Pendergrass. And our closing prayer will be led by Franklin Cagle. It is a tradition here that when someone obeys the gospel that we, we buy them a new Bible and have their name uh, uh, printed on it. This one belongs to Miss Clara May. Oh. 
Would you please bow with me? Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day you've given us, allowing us to be able to come together and worship and praise you and learn more about you so that we can carry on throughout this world the news that we have a hope of eternal life in you. Dear Lord, we ask that you please be with those that have been mentioned here this morning that cannot be with us, that are sick. Please be with them that you can restore them to a much needed state of health so that they can be back with us, be with their caregivers, be with those that have loved ones that have passed away. Put your healing hand of comfort on them. We have several we've mentioned, Lord, that are hurting for the loss, but know that they are hopefully in a much better place with you is, is what we all hope and wish for, Lord. We pray that you please give Keith a ready recollection of what he's prepared, that we can apply it to our lives to help our relationship with you to grow stronger. Please keep our hearts and minds opened, that we can always find an opportunity to help bring others closer to you and live a Christian example in this world for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
So good to see everybody here this morning. If you're, if you're visiting with us, we just want to welcome you as our honored guest today. Uh, and uh, we would encourage you to take out one of the visitor cards that you see in front of you and fill that out. You can put that in the collection plate as it comes around here in a few moments. Or you can give that to me in the back. That's just so we can be hospitable and express our appreciation for you being here with us this morning. Uh, this morning we're going to conclude our series on marriage. It's called When, when Two Become One. We've, we've looked at the biblical meaning of marriage, uh, specifically outlining what Paul has to say in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul says that marriage, as was first instituted, instituted in Genesis chapter 2, is a glorious reflection. It's an amazing illustration of Christ and His church. Of the way Jesus has related to His church. And when we see a faithful husband and a faithful wife patterning their relationship in this way, what we're witnessing is the gospel being reenacted in their relationship. And that's the way that we need to pattern our marriages after and the way that we need to seek to be. Um, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but just, uh, just think about this. Have you ever had your, your dog, if you, those of you who have a dog, wanders out into the woods, comes back, and it stinks. <laughs> it smells like a skunk. <laughs> Because it got sprayed by a skunk. Uh, several years ago when I was growing up, our, we had a, a black lab. And, and she runs off into the woods and, and, run, and runs back to the house whimpering really loud. And smelled absolutely horrible. <laughs> and whenever you would walk by the dog, it would just make you cringe. Like the smell, it would, it would make your eyes water. It was so so distasteful. It was, I did not want to be around the dog. I think my mom gave the dog a bath and a can of tomato sauce. I think that's a, that's a home remedy that people uh, do for that. But it was extremely distasteful to me to smell a dog that had been sprayed by a skunk. Now, all that being said, that is the reaction that many people have today when they hear this word, submission. <laughs> and that's what we're going to talk about this morning, marriage and submission. Because that's what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5. Now, much of the distaste that's surrounding this word and this idea of biblical submission is, is, is due to the radical feminist movement that has grown in prominence within the last several decades within our culture. Uh, there, there are many people that look at Ephesians chapter 5 and Paul's teaching on submission and see it as something that's demeaning. Um, see, see it as something that's degrading towards women. They see it as Paul's attempt to devalue women and promote this kind of an idea that women are less than human in comparison to a man. But what the Bible teaches us and what we're going to see this morning is that idea is not accurate at all. <laughs> Biblical submission as we see within the Bible is far from oppressive. It's far from demeaning. It's rather a beautiful portrayal of Jesus Christ and His church. And, and when both the husband and the wife practice submission in a marriage relationship, it leads to a joyful experience in which God created. And that's what we're going to see and unpack and unfold this morning. So I encourage you to take out your Bible with me and turn to the book of Ephesians, book of Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, now, before we look at Ephesians chapter 5, I, I, I want to lay some ground principles for us to wrap our mind around this passage. Uh, when one becomes a Christian, when one is, is, uh, comes to Jesus and, and, and knows they're, they're, they're not right with God and, uh, and repents of their sin and confess their 
faith in Jesus and is immer- are immersed in the waters of baptism and begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. What the Bible says is happening to that person is that they undergo a radical change, a radical transformation in the way that they relate to people. And that's what the entire New Testament is, 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 is about, practically. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, Paul says... Paul commands the church at Philippi saying, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. So, a gospel-centered, gospel-saturated person that has been changed by Jesus Christ, looks at others and says, I consider their needs to be more important than my own. Count others more significant than yourself. That's a gospel-centered person that has been changed by Jesus Christ. One that drastically has a radical transformation in the way they see other people. Uh, Likewise, in... in, um, Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, as you see on the screen there. It says this, this is from the English Standard Version. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. And not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good. To build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. If you look at humanity throughout history, if you you study different cultures through different time periods, we see that most oftentimes the strong... In any any particular culture, those who possess power and strength and might and fortitude have the prerogative to trample on the weak. You see that all throughout human history in a variety of different cultures throughout the world. And what's interesting is the vast majority of the time... It's only cultures who've been influenced by Christian teaching that tend to reverse that cycle. <laughs> and it, instead of the strong trampling over the weak, the strong taking care of the needs of the weak. When you see a culture and a society that's built, that operates in that kind of, the, kind, of a, kind of a way, more often than not, it's because that culture and society has been influenced drastically by Christianity. <laughs> because this is a Christian principle. In Christianity, the strong serve the weak. Uh, likewise, in, uh, <clears throat> in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Paul says that you're free in Jesus Christ. You have freedom in Jesus. And the way that you legitimately express your freedom in Jesus Christ is by serving one another. You are free in Jesus Christ to become a slave to your brother and sister. You are free in Jesus Christ to serve your neighbor. And if your neighbor embraces the same Christian teaching as you do, they treat you in like manner also. And that just goes to so just goes to show as we've been talking about those who've been changed by the power of the gospel have this radical transformation of how they relate to others. They see themselves as servants. Now, if becoming a servant is the Christian way of life, and it is, as we see over and over throughout the New Testament, then how much more will that principle be applied to the the deepest, most intimate of human relationships that exists? And that is marriage. And that's Paul's point in Ephesians chapter 5. When Paul talks about submission. Submission means to become a servant to one another. 
Uh, turn with me there. Let's, let's, let's look at the text. Let's look at it more closely. Look with me in verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 18. Paul says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So the, the, the verb here, be filled with the Spirit, has several participles in the passage in which it modifies the verb that are connected to the, that's connected to the verb, be filled with the Spirit. Here's how you're filled with the Spirit. By singing and making melody in your heart. By giving thanks. By submitting to one another. That's what it means to live a Spirit-filled life. The Christian life, as we've talked about, it's, it's a new kind of existence. It's a completely new way of doing things. It, it's a life that's been changed by the Spirit of God. And we express that change, that inward transformation of the heart, by singing and giving thanks and submitting to one another. So when we look at this participle here, submitting to one another, what that means is basically becoming a servant. <laughs> we as Christians, what are we? We are servants. We are servants to one another. We submit to each other in that way. And that means, it, it doesn't mean this, submission, servitude in that way, it doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. It doesn't mean devaluing yourself, saying, well, this person, everybody else just has so much more value than I do. Um, now that I'm a Christian, I, I see my self-worth as very low. I see myself as someone that's, that's like a doormat, that's not worthy of anything, so I'm just going to serve other people. That's not the... That's not, the idea of what a Christian is. And that's not what submission is. Submission is not thinking less of yourself, but it's rather thinking of yourself less. Submission is thinking of yourself less. That's what biblical submission is. And then Paul, he uses that idea in verse 21 is kind of a springboard to talk about what submission specifically looks like in all different kinds of human relationships. You know, if you skip to chapter 6, he talks about masters and servants. Servants, obey your masters. Masters, don't be harsh with your servants. He talks about... Um, uh, ch parents and children, the relationship that they have to one another. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. So this is the way that, these are ways that we become servants to one another. This is the way that we take the focus off of ourself and place it upon another person, not devaluing ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. And Paul also talks about what that looks like, thinking of yourself less, what that looks like in marriage, in a marriage context. Now let's look at the text and, uh, and, and, and see, uh, unfold what Paul says here. Look with me in verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 22. This is Paul's instruction to wives. Paul says, wives, submit to your own husbands. And that, that's, that's important right there. As to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. As also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, first of all, 
one thing that I want to point out is what the text says first in verse 22. He says, wives, submit to your own husband. Uh, So one of the ideas that people get when they look at this text is Paul is teaching this idea that women have to submit to men. (laughs) Men are more valuable than men. Men are more intelligent than women. And so women must submit to men. That's not what Paul says. (laughs) Paul says, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Paul is not commanding women to, in general, in this way, to submit to men. This is a directive of wives to submit in everything to their own husbands. So with that idea in mind, what does that mean? What does it mean for a wife to submit to her own husband? It, 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 it means this. It means to willingly come under the authority of someone else. Not forcefully, not tyrannically, but willingly sacrifice my will and come under the headship of someone else. That's basically what submission means in this context. If if you look at the Greek word, uh, the, the original word that's behind the word submit here rendered in the New King James, it's hupotasso. Uh, it, it's a military word that's, uh, that it, it refers to a soldier that comes under the authority and leadership of another person. So when, when, when one submits in this way, they're, they're recognizing the leadership role that has been given to the one in authority and are willfully suppressing their own will and respecting the authority of the one that it's been given to. Now, that idea is not foreign to us at all. <laughs> we practice that and, 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 and uh, allow that to be in our lives every single day. This kind of submission is a part of everyday life. Those of you who play sports, you submit to a coach... If, you, if a, 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 Take a, a football team. You've got a, a head coach, the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, the, the receiver coaches, the, uh, the, the line coaches are, in a sense, all in submission to the head coach. Doesn't imply that all the other coaches are, are, are inferior in value to the head coach. It just, it, it, it's a hierarchy of authority that allows things to function. It's a part of everyday life. Uh, if, uh, you know, we, when you go to work, you submit to a boss. <laughs> uh, when, you, when you go to your work, you come under their authority and their headship. That's the way our government works. We have a commander-in-chief, right? In which multiple people are in submission to him. So, you know, just logically, for, for, for a collective unit consisting of individual minds to function properly, there has to be a party that serves as the authority and a party that submits to that authority. I mean, just, just for, for an example, the, the, the football team analogy. Say if, just, just by, solely by way of illustration, if, uh, if submission was an oppressive and tyrannical idea when it comes to a football team, and all of the coaches on a football team had the same level of authority... How do you think that team is going to function? Very poorly. <laughs> That's going to be the worst team that has ever been. If every coach has the same weight, has the same level of authority, it would be absolute chaos if that, if, if that were the case. So this idea of submission of willfully coming under the authority of another person, it's, it's, not, a, it's not oppressive. I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't imply 
a lack of t- intelligence. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have to do with inferiority or superiority. It doesn't mean that you have to leave your brain at the door and surrender your critical thinking. That's not what Paul is saying whatsoever. Submission is necessary for life to function. And in Paul's argument, in Paul's logic, including marriage. So, a wife, when a wife submits to her husband, what what that basically is, what that means is that she recognizes and willfully yields to his authority and his leadership as the church does joyfully in relation to Jesus Christ. A a wife participates in decision-making, but ultimately says in her heart of hearts, I respect your decision. Uh, she, She affirms his strength and his masculinity as a part of biblical submission. She supports his self-image as a leader and speaks well of him. She, she, she's gracious when he fails. And I don't know about you, but men make a lot of mistakes, right? <laughs> she's gracious when he fails. That's a part of biblical submission. And, and, and the truth is that when, when wives do this, when wives, when wives willfully come under the authority of their husbands, they're imitating Jesus, who himself submitted in all things to the will of the Father. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, by becoming obedient, even to the point of death. So this idea of submission, it's not, it's not oppressive. It's not a horrible thing. It's a beautiful thing that portrays Jesus Christ. Now, let's transition for the time we have left and look at uh, Paul's directive to the husbands and see what this idea of submission looks like in the context of, of, of a husband's relationship toward his wife. Look with me in verse 25. Ephesians 5, 25. Paul says, Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave, very important word, gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, the, the mistake that many people make when they approach this passage is that they view the husband's authority in a marriage relationship in the context of like a Caesar who sits in his lofty golden tower and uh, looks down upon all those lowly citizens that are beneath him and tells them to make him sandwiches. <laughs> Uh, That's the way a lot of people look at this text. Look at the way that a husband's authority is rendered in that way. But that idea, it tragically misses the mark of what husbandly authority in a marriage context is supposed to look like. As, As Paul says in verse 21, a husband is to submit to his wife by putting himself second as Christ has done in relationship to his church as he put himself second and gave of himself so that his church might be blessed, so that his church might be, might be washed and sprinkled clean and made holy. Now, let's, let's continue in the passage. Let's look closely at what, at what this looks like specifically from a husband's standpoint. Look with me at verse 28. So, husbands ought to love their wives. How do, we, how, do, how do husbands love their wives? As their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Husbands, rhetorical question, ask yourself. Do you love yourself? Ask yourself that. Do I, do I love myself? Hmm. Do you love yourself? You would be lying if you said no. <laughs> Uh, do you, do you want to be fed? You like, you, you want to eat? Of course you do. 
Do, do you want to be happy and satisfied in your life? Of course you do. Any sane, rational person would say so. Do, do, do you want to live a life that's free of pain and free of suffering? Husbands. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And it's because, according to the logic of the passage, it's because you love yourself, meaning that you want your well-being. All of us do, right? All of us want what's best for us. All of us desires our well-being that we may experience happiness. We don't want to we don't want to be miserable. We want to be we want to have the good life. All of us do. That means that we love ourselves in that way. Paul is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying to husbands that they are to love their wives in like manner as they love their own selves. Look inside of yourself and see the degree to which you love your own self, which can be seen by how you pursue your own well-being and make that the standard, husbands, of how you relate to your wife. <laughs> because that is how Jesus has related to his church. It's the love your neighbor as yourself principle. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is basically saying, husbands, love your wife like you love yourself. The degree to which you love yourself and desire your own well-being, show that kind of love toward your wife. And then he continues in verse 29. For no one, no one ever hated his own flesh. He continues that, that same thinking. But he nourishes and he cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. I want you to think about this with me. Jesus Christ loves his church like he loves his own self. Jesus Christ loves his church like he loves his own self. The magnitude of God's own self love is the standard by which he loves the church. And that's what Paul is saying in this passage. The church is like God's own body. He nourishes it. He cherishes it. The, the church as the body of Christ is an analogy that's used over and over and over again. He treats his, he treats his church like he, treats, he, like he treats his own body. He does what's necessary to make it thrive and to bring about its well-being. That's how deeply Christ's affections extend towards his people. Jesus takes the love your neighbor as yourself principle and applies it to himself in the direction of his church. And Paul's directive to husbands here is that they are to love, they are to pattern their love and the way that they exercise their authority, the way that they exercise their leadership, not as a Caesar who sits at his lofty palace, but as a servant who becomes like Jesus Christ and loves their wife like they love themselves, cherish her and chase after her well-being like Jesus has done to the church. And all of this, of course, uh, especially a husband's submission to his wife in this way is intended to preach to the world the love of Jesus Christ. So wh whether, wh whether we're a husband or a wife, it, it doesn't matter if you're a husband or you're a wife. We're not to live for ourselves. <laughs> That's what Paul is basically saying in Ephesians chapter 5. But we are to live for the other. We're, we're, we're not to think less of ourself. That's not what submission is from either angle, from the angle of a husband or the angle of a wife. But we are to think of ourselves less. And that's what it means to become a servant. That's what it means to submit to one another. Both husbands and wives reflect the heart of Jesus Christ through submission 
in marriage. And that's the mystery, brothers and sisters. I tell you a great mystery, a profound mystery. Marriage is concerning Christ and the church. When you see a husband, when you see a wife submitting to one another as patterned after this, you're seeing a picture of the gospel. And, and, and it's when we, we commit to treating our spouses this way and upholding this high, high and glorious standard of marriage does the world look at us and say, wow, I want to be like that. I see something different about those people. So this is where we're going to end our series on marriage. We're going to move on to something else next week. But hopefully that has helped our perspective on this most glorious and intimate relationship that God has instituted. Marriage, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus. And it's all about showing people who Jesus is. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, we, all of us, encourage you to come if you, to he, hear the good news that Jesus Christ lives and He reigns. He's seated, he seated at the right hand of God, exercising His reign and authority over creation. He's died for the sins of humanity, was raised so that we might be sanctified and experience a new, a new kind of existence. Believe on Him. Do a change. Turn around. Repent. You can come forward and confess your faith publicly and be immersed in the waters of baptism and begin a walk with Jesus Christ. This morning, if you have any need, come forward as we stand and as we sing.
gather around this table. Let's focus our hearts and our minds on that sacrifice that was made for each and every one of us and Jesus' death on that cross. Let us pray. Dear God, we come to you at this time so thankful for the love that you have for us, the love that you've shown by sending your son to this earth to live and then to die on that cross for each and every one of us. Father, we pray that as we partake of this bread, which to us as Christians represents your son's body, that we will do so in a manner that's right, well-pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. In like manner, Heavenly Father, we continue to focus our minds and our hearts on that cruel cross. Jesus paid a debt that we could never pay, one that he didn't know, the blood that was shed for each and every one of us. Father, we pray that as we would take of this juice to fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents your son's blood, that we will do so in a manner pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
just as we find instructions together on the first day of the week to take the Lord's Supper, we also find instructions that we are supposed to spread God's Word and remember that everything that we have comes from above. Uh, at this time, let's pray. Dear God, as we come to you at this time, we're so thankful for the health that each of us have. We are thankful for all the many blessings that we, that we have here on earth. We know that everything that we do have comes from you. Father, we pray that we will always want to spread your word and continue the work. We pray that we will give back in a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us come here today and worship you, Lord, for sending your Son on the cross to die, that we may have the eternal gift of heaven with you, Lord. Please help us as we leave, that we will return safely at the next point in time. Be with those, Lord. Be with those that are fighting for our country. 
you know, those that are sick and those that are not with you, Lord, that they may bring back in your light and attend with us again. In Christ's holy, wonderful name we pray. Amen.